fighting back against the outrageous interest on payday loans. But first, two Amber Alerts highlight a growing domestic violence problem. Plus, when government meetings and public comments violate social media policies. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. This is Kansas Week, and I'm your host, Pilar Pedraza. In the last week, both the Harvey County Commission and Hutchinson Public Schools have had videos of public meetings taken down from social media platforms for violating the site's rules. Cakes Jackson Overstreet explains how. The Harvey County Commission meets in this room every Tuesday morning for their regular meetings, which are also streamed via those cameras onto YouTube. That includes the meeting on August 3rd, but since then, that video has been taken down by YouTube. We've received a warning. Um, the next would be a strike and we have can only receive three of them. In an email sent from YouTube, the social media company says it took down the video because it violated the site's medical misinformation policy. The only medical information that was discussed during that meeting was during the citizens forum portion of the meeting and then also during our department head report. Something similar happening with the Hutchinson Public School District on Monday. The district streaming its Board of Education meeting on Facebook, which included discussion of COVID policies for this year. The next day, staff noticed that the video was no longer there. Facebook sending the district this email Wednesday morning explaining why. It went against those community standards for repeating comments, um, fraudulent claims, misinformation, things like that. Both the district and the county say they are going to continue to use these social media platforms for now because they provide the easiest way to communicate with the public. But they say they'll look at other options in case something similar happens in the future. Hutchinson Public Schools also appealing the takedown. As it is unfortunate and frustrating that, you know, our public participation may have been the reason that the video was flagged. As for Harvey County, they also appealed their video being taken down, but that was denied by YouTube. In Newton, Jackson Overstreet, Cake News on your side. And here to hash this out with us today, I'm joined by Dr. Dr. Neil Allen, a political scientist from Wichita State. If I can talk today, that could be a big test today. And John Wright, the news director at KQAM. Thank you both for joining me today. And, uh, you know, I'm going to throw this out there. I is this really a surprise or should we have seen this coming? I mean, this is the intersection of government, open government, and a private company. Well, that's right. And we should remember that... Um you know, YouTube, which is part of the Google um, monstrous network, and then Facebook, which is Facebook. You know, they do a lot of things that media companies used to do, and they really are media companies. And also, they're, they're being reliant on to do public information, partly because they're able to do it, and do it in ways that are far beyond the capacity of governments, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But they have their own standards. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of this action is actually about algorithms and computers that aren't, aren't actually individual people, because I doubt if they have enough people to be staffing the Harvey County <laughs> and Hutchinson public school meetings. Uh, but also, it just shows that we cannot depend upon these companies to do our public work for us as our only option. Um, but also, like, I mean, part of the work of government and also just of society now is having a place for people to say what they think. And if you are going to cut out everything that is medically incorrect about public comments in the last year or two, then you're going to cut out all the public comments because there are citizens saying things all the time at public meetings that are wrong. And some of the best way to, to counteract that is to allow the public officials to hear them and then make a different decision. But now we're having problems about disseminating those decisions. And then social media being what it is, <laughs> there's a wide range of viewpoints that are trying to get the squeaky wheel to get the grease, but they're going to make some noise. And in certain parts of the country, obviously Kansas is a red state, we're going to hear more of those views. We're going to hear questions about those important uh, topics, but what's going out there? Is it accurate? Is it right? And the, like Dr. Allen mentioned, the alpha, algorithms, I'm having trouble speaking. <laughs> it's contagious. Uh, because you can find that on your telephone. Mm -hmm. that you, you repeat things that you see, and what well, I've already seen, and why am I scrolling back, and it comes right back again. So there's obviously something going on. With this. And, and also here, I mean, I'm not sure how to get out of this box, but a situation, but we can't have a situation for de in our democratic uh, republic where you have a citizen could come and say something that was said by the sitting president of the United States a year ago 
and then have that be ruled medical misinformation and then citizens can't have access to that meeting. And, um, but you know, this is the world we live in whenever four or five tech companies are uh, run our interface with each other. Yeah. Well, and you talked, both of you talked about the algorithms. I mean, it was probably about a year and a half or so ago, there was an issue with Facebook where if you made a comment with the word coronavirus in the comment, it was immediately dropped because something had gone wrong with the algorithm. That's kind of one of those steps when we let computers do the thinking for us it's and it seems to be happening more and more because there are so many of us on social media and but, facebook jail is real i've been in there a couple of times <laughs> myself well but. and and i never am because i don't post but um but <laughs> one way to say yeah, but, but but also though we should note here that you know when i was in indiana 30 years ago i didn't have and my family didn't have access to live streaming or recordings of public meetings because we had five channels over a television antenna. Now we did have a, a newspaper that was staffed a lot better than they can be these days, but also though, you know, we kind of assume that Facebook would, or equivalent would provide us with um, access to um, transcripts and also to video of every meeting. And maybe we just can't count on that. No, no the people just have to do the work themselves. The people are too, too busy going back and forth with whatever's going on and they're going to tune into social media. Oh, I hear that. Man, I agree with that. That must be true. People have to do some more digging. Yeah. Can't tell you the number of times I've thought something was interesting, researched it just to be on the safe side because I don't like getting caught flat footed and found out it was false. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Well, another thing to talk about that has really kind of made a lot of headlines the last week, two Amber Alerts in Kansas, both the result of domestic disputes. As Cake's Eli Higgins shows us, Kansas counselors say these situations are more common than you might think. If you live in Wichita, your phone has probably blown up multiple times over the last week with Amber Alerts. They've all involved parents and the Wichita Family Crisis Center says it's more common than you think. Well, unfortunately, often um, in domestic violence situations, the abuser, you know, uses children as another means for power and control. Amy Cox is the development director for the Wichita Family Crisis Center, and she's seen it all. It happens a lot, again, in that cycle of power and control. The children are often um, caught in that situation. And most of the, the women who come to our shelter, I say women, though we also get men who are abused, but most arrive with nothing but their children. Thankfully, the recent Amber Alerts have ended without injury, but Cox says there will be more cases. While domestic violence has been steadily increasing even before the pandemic, she says it's even worse this year. In the past year has been a 30 to 40 percent increase in not only the instance of domestic violence, but the severity of domestic violence. Um, a lot more injuries to the face, strangulation, a lot more violent. Um, you know, life threatening injuries than we've seen in the past. Cox says if you're in an abusive situation, the best thing you can do is get help before it gets worse. The crisis center will be there to help every step of the way. We need more resources and more, um, more funding and more people to help those children um, escape the cycle of domestic violence because often the recidivism is very high with, with children of victims. In Wichita, Eli Higgins, Cake News on your side. Now, one thing we do know from the last week is that the Amber Alerts do work. I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, one of them woke me up in the middle of the night when phones started going off in our bedroom. They get the word out there and they get it quickly and these kids are being found. That's good news, right, John? It is good news because you have a certain amount of time to locate the suspect and to get the young, young people, if that's who's involved, which is a reason for the Amber Alert located to get them out of harm's way if that's what it is now several years ago it didn't used to be that way mm -hmm. it had some kind of criteria that it had to hit and time was lagging but fortunately from what i understand in one of these cases recently the license tag and the light cameras played a significant role yes. in assisting mm -hmm. locating the most recent one and so that obviously turned out to be a good thing where officers didn't have to scour all over. They can track the car through the license, mm -hmm. license plate through the uh, uh, light camera system. Yeah. yeah, technology definitely making a difference in, in helping in the searches. But of course, for everybody, I think we'd be happier if these situations weren't happening. We've seen an increase for several years. 
It's come up, but it really hasn't been that seriously discussed, at least not that I've seen at the state house. Is it just that it's being overshadowed by other issues or? Well, I mean, we, you know, we shouldn't note the kind of progress that our society has made in the last few decades. Uh, and one important uh, it, um, actual public policy response to domestic violence is actually about divorce and making divorce much easier to, to access for those that are in a, a abusive marriage. And it wasn't that long ago in this country, you know, in five or six decades, that there was not no fault divorces in most states. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but as far as, you know, the, the policy responses, well, one, there's a lot of things you can do with money, um, you know, to fund social services, um, also, there's all kinds of people that deal with these problems you don't necessarily see. Um, the you know heroes that take on foster kids that often come out of these these homes, and also the you know there's uh, more money for drug treatment, more money for alcohol treatment because a lot of these things are substance r related. But also, the pandemic, for good or for ill, has put those of uh, us who have family members in close contact with them for a long period of time. And most of us are lucky to have good family relationships that don't turn into this. But we're going to have, you know, these kind of things all the time. And also we should note that Amber Alerts are important. They're a policy response that can help in certain situations. But the vast majority of abuse is not going to be subject to an Amber Alert or to us talking mm. on television. And there's this happening all over the place in houses that we walk by and we don't know. And if yeah. you think that you don't know anybody who's affected, then you probably um, are mistaken. Yeah, I know yeah. A, a recent conversation I was having with folks over at the Wichita Family Crisis Center, and they said there is no demographic mm -mm. for domestic violence. There isn't. There's no age range. There's no financial range. There is no specific demographic that says, okay, that's where we're going to see it. It happens everywhere. And the thing about it is no one really wants to talk about it because there's so many of those uh, interwoven issues, mental health being among uh, a big part of it. Then I guess financial maybe putting some pressure on families, uh, the breadwinner, um, the, 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 the uh, the wife involved, if that's the case, or the significant other, not being allowed to go out and participate, and there's still that mindset of uh, the, I'm the man, I'm the gatherer, I'm the hunter-gatherer, you're the nester, you provide the home. So there's a, a lot of dynamics in there, mm -hmm. and uh, the mental health, and it, it just needs to be dealt with a little bit more effectively. Yeah. But then again, we're talking about putting money in front of it uh, behind it instead of jumping out in front of it. So mm -hmm. hopefully uh, the local agencies that are here in town and others that support can uh, help in this regard. Yeah. Well, we know state leaders working on a number of things. This last week they took their fight against payday loan companies to each East Wichita. One victim tells Cake's John Hayes, enough is enough. Get information. They didn't send me no notice. That's just one of at least a dozen people turning out at a payday loan town hall in District 1 Monday night. Some of them there to educate themselves. Others, like Courtney, say they've already been victims of an exploited system. So, hey, when I get a chance, I'll try and set it on the payment arrangement. Let's work something out. No, we need all our money up for it. The event, organized in collaboration with Vice Mayor Brandon Johnson, Senator Aletha Faust Gadeau and several organizations geared towards educating Kansans. They say payday lenders can charge up on average more than 300% interest on loans. Johnson says that burden can turn what was already a difficult situation for people into a crisis. Oh, well, you know, personal responsibility. You know what you're signing. It's not true. Community advocates like Tawana Hardwell say they pushed back against lenders in the past, including organizing a peaceful protest last November. Hardwell says it's time for change. They fall behind. They can lose their jobs. They can lose their transportation if they get a title loan against their vehicle. These are people who are losing their way to work. For everything we do, we've got to work quickly. But Senator Faust Godot says she's fighting an uphill battle at the State House to get something done. We do need this uh, uh, industry to fill in the gap but we don't need them to rob us blind. She wants to put a cap on interest rates, require installment plan offers, and limit paycheck garnishments. Now she says she just needs more Kansans to step up and help. In Wichita, John Hayes, Cake News on your side.
And I know I have covered several times as uh, Senator Faust Godot, uh, State Representative Ahibasim, have brought some of these bills forward and they really haven't gained any traction. Uh, it, it, I have to wonder how much of that is because these payday loan companies pop up in urban, low-income neighborhoods and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of people. And I live where that demonstration took place for at least 30 years. Right now, that area is a food desert. We have more payday loans than liquor stores, than to smoke shops. Now, it may fill in a gap for people who don't have bank accounts and what have you and are strapped for finances, but the bleeding has to stop. You can't suck a person dry who's already gasping their last breath and then you take that away by giving them the loan but then you come back with extremely high interest rates and it's where's the humanity in this now the legislature yes they do have a lot of things going on up there but this is to me a person to person how do you run your business is there a regular regulator out there watching these companies to rein them in or to make their their paperwork more people friendly, more user friendly, more uh, customer relation friendly, because most of the businesses, yes, they do have their guidelines, but here we're talking about people on a fence and they're already hanging on by a thread and they receive the money, they feel great, they're gonna take care of it, then they look, the devil's in the details and then we have a nearly 400% interest rate. There's no way they're gonna catch up. That's why they needed it in the first place. So something has to be done. What, I don't know, but um, you could probably start a payday loan or these type of companies quicker than you could uh, uh, a grocery store in our neighborhood anyway. Yeah, well, and we've definitely seen that yes. play out over yes, the last few years. Yes, we have, and it's a crying shame. It really yeah. is. But I, I ha have to ask, uh, Neil, as we look at the legislative side of this, you know, there's been a push for several years. It's not gained traction. What does it take to get lawmakers' attention for something like this to move forward? Well, we should note here that, you know, the, the free market is a bedrock principle in our society. And in general, we have the principle that if someone wants to provide a good or service, then they should be able to do so. Now, the question here is, do you conceive of debt as itself a toxic product? So for example, um, I can go out and buy a, lots of different kinds of cars, but I'm not allowed to buy, a, but th th nobody's allowed to sell a car to me with brakes that are only gonna work 20 to 30 times before they fail. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is a payday loan like that? And you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea about regulation. And also my thought is, if you can't make money charging 200% interest with the ability to charge fees and also the ability to, um, to, uh, to seize people's cars or other assets, then I'm not sure that's a business that we need. Uh, and, but states differ a whole lot on what their interest, ca interest rate caps are. Mm -hmm. If you bring it down to, let's say, something like 30 or 40%, then in effect, these businesses cannot operate because the numbers then get too small and they'll, and they'll fail because they're going to have lots of people defaulting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just the nature of the business. But also, another way to think of it is find a way for the government to support other kinds of better credit. And one way to do so, frankly, is loan money at the post office because it's a business, it's an entity that will always exist. Other countries do it that way. It doesn't have to make money. Um, they're not gonna have the super fancy mortgages and, and, and things that, that actual commercial banks have, but just allow people to have a small place where they can bank and, and establish some amount of credit so then they don't wind up at the, at the payday loan place mm -hmm. that really doesn't care about them. And we know in business, it's not unusual in business for a business to have small loans to carry operating costs until certain income comes in, so that it's not a unique concept. It's the interest rates that it's are the in interest question. rates that's the hook. And sometimes people don't wait, they're such in a hurry because they've got this load of debt 
and the lights and, and the water bill and gas. They're just trying to get their hands on that money. Okay, I'm going to sign. Where do I sign? Mm -hmm. And as Dr. Allen alluded to this in another topic, in some cultures, the finances is not one of the topics at the dinner table. So people are going in there thinking one thing when they should be looking at the bottom line numbers. And as uh, Councilman Johnson mentioned, personal responsibility may be not so much a part of this as far as being educated enough mm. to know what to look for, to be uh, budget savvy and financial savvy before you even hit the place, because you know you're gonna incur a large amount of debt due to interest rates anyway. So all of that needs, and I keep going back to this on the front end, the, the payday loans, they're at the back end after the trouble hits, but it would be nice if the community, some organization, and there are some out there that provide some financial education. So it might be more of that needs to be done. Well, state lawmakers do a lot of that, or at least they should be doing a lot of that. How we elect them, though, kind of up for grabs this year as we're working on redistricting. And we're starting to get a better idea of how Kansas has changed over the last decade with the release this last week of new census numbers outlining state demographics. But will that turn into a change in how lawmakers approach redistricting? Some Kansans are hoping so. The Associated Press reports most Kansas counties lost residents over the last 10 years as Kansans moved to the cities. That was one of the key takeaways from the new census figures the Bureau released Thursday. 80 of Kansas 100 counties lost residents, 16 of them by more than 10 percent. Meanwhile, five of the top 10 fastest growing counties were in or around the KC metro area. Overall, Kansas saw a 3 percent increase in population. These changes mean a shift in political power across the state. The Kansas Reflector reports Kansans marked the new numbers by, quote, pummeling state legislators on a listening tour with demands for new political boundary maps that emphasize community interests rather than partisan aspirations. Despite criticism of lawmakers' decision to pack 14 listening sessions into just this last week, each session has been filled to overflowing with Kansans wanting to have their say. Many who showed up, though, say they want to see more public meetings once more census data becomes available. Now, we know from speaking with state lawmakers, more meetings are probably not going to happen. Uh, we've had the conversation on here for multiple episodes over the last few weeks as we've discussed redistricting that most folks don't think anything said in these meetings is going to have any impact on how redistricting happens. But at least for the folks who are showing up, there's at least that hope that their presence will make a difference. I'm gonna let Dr. Allen take this one first. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, so um, we should note here that redistricting has to happen because we have, a, we have a census. And so the current boundaries in every district that elects people in the country uh, is out of balance somehow. Um, we should note the U.S. Senate is completely malapportioned, but is the one legislature in the country that is, that is uh, exempted from this. But um, so like on the U.S. House map here in, in Kansas, we have four districts. One of them has too many people. The third district, which is Cerise Davids' district, the one Democrat, that includes Johnson County, Wyandotte County, and a little bit of Miami County. Uh, our district here in Wichita looks to be about the, about the size it needs to be. And then the other two, the first, which is the most of the western part of the state, the second, which is southeast and Topeka Lawrence, they're a little bit too small. So they're going to have, we're going to have to shift lines that way. Mm -hmm. um, and also, in Kansas, we have an interesting situation here in that the people having control of the process are conservative Republicans. And that's the first time they will have had control of this process in many decades. Um, but the places that have grown the fastest are those that tend to elect Democrats and moderates. And so that's in heavily Johnson County in Northeast Kansas, but as metro areas in general. Yeah. So it's going to be more difficult to gerrymander Democrats and moderates out of their seats. This is a national, um, in some ways, surprise because the numbers that came out yesterday um, showed that urban areas grew even more than people thought of. But on redistricting, there is no pure, fair way to do this. And um, there, um, there are some states that have nonpartisan commissions. I wish we had one here in Kansas, not because they get you pure, fair maps, because they tend to make things more competitive. 
Uh, and in Kansas, we've had lots of competitive elections for the legislature in the last 10 years because judges drew the maps because the legislature couldn't get their stuff together to do it themselves. Uh, but on the issue of the listening sessions, I went to one here in Wichita over at the WSU Metroplex at 29th and Oliver. It was a huge crowd, um, but also it's hard to figure out what you're going to say. Um, and so citizens tended to want nonpartisan maps. They want maps that unite communities of interest. They think those two things can't go together, and sometimes they do. Uh, but I, what I expect here is that conservative uh, legislators will likely try to benefit themselves. And that's what politicians tend to do, and they're the ones that are in the saddle right now. Yeah. And to put a caveat, on, to put the button on that, with the population decrease, those boundaries may change because of partisan politics and a lot of people moving out of these areas, especially urban areas, puts a different viewpoint. And uh, even some Democrats are conservative as much as Republicans. However, their interests are different. They're not tending to go too far too quickly, and therefore um, that still needs to be hashed out. And also we should note that the kind of competing coalitions in Kansas politics for the last decade or so, if, if not longer, have been um, conservative Republicans that want to shrink the size of government. And the other coalition is Democrats plus moderate Republicans, however you define them, that want to maintain the size of government, particularly involving public schools. And so of the anti-conservative Republican coalition, um, the, um, the areas that have grown are the ones where the liberals um, and Democrats tend to do well. The ones that have shrunk is frankly a lot of their coalition on public schools that have been rural areas and rural Republicans. And so it's going to be difficult to draw lines to maintain all of our Western and Southeast Kansas representatives in their seats. Um, and even if we can maintain those seats, they might have to change a lot because those areas have been depopulating and, um, and their power in the legislature is going to decrease. Yeah. Now, you brought up the nonpartisan commissions. I came to Kansas from Iowa, which has kind of one of the premier nonpartisan setups for redistricting. In fact, they refer to it as the Iowa model. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it really, the, my first round of redistricting in Kansas kind of took me by surprise because I wasn't used to that. I was used to, okay, Here's this nonpartisan commission. We drew a map. Lawmakers give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And sometimes they might go through eight, nine, ten maps before they get enough votes for a thumb to be the new districts. But, and they have a time limit. They, they have a time limit, and we don't have that. What? And, you know, ten years ago, we ran into the point where you had maps coming down the day candidates had to file. <laughs> yeah, and, and, right, that was, and that was a disaster because also, um, it made it difficult for candidates to plan. We had a bunch of member versus member fights in the state house and lost a tons of, of expertise. But I'm sure we're going to see lots of action on that all the way through to the end of the session in April of next yeah. year. All right. And we're going to have to leave it there. Neil, John, thank you so much for joining me. We are out of time. I'd also like to thank our news partners at KSN News, the Wichita Eagle, and Cake News for sharing their materials with us. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. We'd love to continue with you online. Just look for PLR Pedraza TV or PBS Kansas on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For now, stay safe and have a great week.